I can hear a strange drumming sound. He's good, isn't he? Look. What do you reckon he's doing out there, Mac 2? It's lovely to see. It looks like a, a great pursuit. Yeah, I've rowed here for about three years now. Right. So um, my, grand, my granddad used to row as well. Right. And um, he's rowed on this river, and now I'm doing it too, which is quite yeah. nice to think. The other week, us four went out in this quad, and we splashed a bit each other. Right. And like, we all got a bit itchy. So you've actually had a, like a sort of, like an, yeah. a toxic all of us, response. Yeah. 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 You all have. Yeah. yeah, we all came out with like red patches on our arms and yeah. backs, and yeah. and where was where did this happen? We're well, just pretty just much all down here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Obviously, the river isn't very clean. Like you look at it, it's actually kind of gross. It's full of mud and yeah. dirt and poo. <laughs> we didn't really think much of it because yeah. we kind of thought right. it was like normal now. Yeah, but it's not normal, is yeah. it? And it shouldn't yeah. be normal. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be immersed in something that's doing that. Rivers and waterways are a vital part of our landscape. But sadly, all is not well. Whether it's the actions of industry, water companies, agriculture, or us as citizens, our rivers are taking a battering. I'm travelling around England and Wales to explore what is going on. I've already seen some of the pressures our rivers are facing in the north. And this is just five minutes spent on a riverbed. Oh, my God. We found the highest concentration of microplastics that we've seen on any riverbed in the world. In the world? Now, I'm keen to see what's happening elsewhere. It really is blanket <laughs> weed, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a sort of industrial Sistine Chapel, isn't it? Meeting the people on the front line... We've been kicking up a huge fuss in every single way that we can. So the beavers are providing natural filter systems. And seeing the true cost of our polluted water. The water company's dumped God knows what last night, and they've gone into a skip 7,000 oysters. It is, to all intents and purposes, dead. Eternal damnation to all polluters. I'm very passionate about rivers. It's, it's an emotional sort of thing with me. I, I've, I've always been attached to them since I was very small. It reminds me of the bond I had with my dad. So I feel it quite intensely and I, you know, I sort of feel their pain in a way. I know it sounds a bit tree huggy, but I really do. I'm in the south, close to the border between England and Wales and a stretch of river I know very well, the magnificent Wye. Winding from its headwaters in mid Wales to the Severn Estuary, it's often cited as the nation's favourite river, beloved by the Muppet Bob Morton. Oh, so refreshing! For the three of us, I think the River Wye has been a, an absolute godsend. We've met through the River Wye. We've become firm friends through the River Wye. There's always somebody that's happy to don the costume and come in. <laughs> Just want to get in the River Wye as quickly as possible, as many days of the week as possible. It's all about sitting afterwards with your flask of hot chocolate when you're getting warm, and cake, quite often. Definitely have to have cake, because when you've been in there, you need cake to recuperate. When you get in it, it lifts your mood. However, however crappy a day you've had, however bad things are, going in the Y just makes things better. And you missed two kingfishers. <laughs> just came up here and into there. The first time I came to the Y was fishing with my dad as a kid, and I was blown away by its beauty. The adult salmon may not feed in the river, but the young fish do. After two years as fry, the little salmon change. 
They are now known to fishing folk as pa. Back then, everywhere you looked, there was an abundance of life. And you were surrounded by the sounds of nature. But sadly, for this beguiling river, things have changed dramatically. Beneath the surface, all is not well. Parts of the Wai have been overwhelmed by pollution with devastating consequences. The River Wai turned lime green. It should be clear. It was absolutely shocking. But a major source of river pollution is from agriculture, with the Wai one of those badly affected. Many of the upper stretches of the Wai are being affected by problems linked to intensive farming. I'm meeting up with an old fishing mate who has witnessed the many woes of the Wai. He's someone I've dangled my rod with countless times over the years. John Bailey. Paul Whitehouse. Look at you in the river already. You didn't wait for me, did you? Well, I never know when you're going to arrive. <laughs> no, that's a you good point. You missed absolutely nothing. Are you going to get your chesties on? <laughs> John Bailey is uh, somebody I'm very close to. He certainly knows his stuff about the River Wye and has fished the Wye for probably 40 years. But he's really young. Oh, oh straight in, as the actress said to the bishop. A bit slimy, isn't it? If I brought you here, Ten years ago, we'd be dive-bombed by swallow swifts, still sand martins, and there'd have been swans in their scores on here. It would be carpeted, as far as the eye could see, with luxuriant, waving weed. Ranunculus. And, uh, yeah, right, mm. ranunculus. Mm. Look at it now. So we've got a tiny bit of weed there. Look, there's an even tinier bit just there. It's like a blade of grass, isn't it? that you might casually stick in your mouth while chatting to a fair maiden. <laughs> Blade of grass yeah. in a desert. Yeah. If we yeah. pick up a stone here, mm -hmm. um, anyone will do. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, you've, so you've got this greeny silt algae all over it. Yeah. I can see Johnny's everywhere. It's right the way across mm. the river. Back in the 90s, these gravels would have been polished like diamonds. It's just it's been carpeted, isn't it's it? It's just carpeted with growth. Why? I think it's definitely fertiliser. Right. It's an overloading of nitrates, phosphates. The biggest source of the sludge on this riverbed is farming, and it works a bit like this. The animals we intensively rear for food produce a lot of poo, filth, Richard III's. You know what I mean. This stuff is full of nutrients like phosphate, so farmers spread it to grow grass for livestock and crops for us. When it rains, these nutrients can end up in the river and it all starts to go a bit peat tonk. The algae go mad for the stuff and grow like no one's business, taking over the river and killing off other life. It has a disastrous effect on how the river looks. And of course, very many summers, uh, this just runs like pea green soup. You yeah. know, the algal growth is yeah. horrendous. There have always been phosphates on the land right. and hence in the river. It is just the fact that there are approaching 20 million chickens and 20 million chickens in the Y catchment. That's more than the population is, of Belgium. It is a huge amount. Mm. A, a huge amount of poo has mm. to be got rid of. You're witnessing the decline of a thing of majestic beauty. It is, to all intents and purposes, mate, dead. The demise of the Y has angered many locals like John. Of chemical runoff 
from agricultural practices end up in our rivers. Much of this anger is directed at the intensive chicken industry, which has exploded across the country in recent years to satisfy our need for cheap food. I've crossed over the border into Wales, following the Wye up to its higher tributaries. The Ithon flows directly into the Wye and is a river plagued by high levels of phosphate pollution. Using my vast brain, I'm pretty sure we must be in agricultural territory because I just saw some cows and sheep. What a surprise, eh? Sheep in Wales. The Ithon Valley has a high concentration of our feathery friends. A chicken run, a chicken run. Old West Ham chant there. Yeah, that's it. We they are. All right. Yeah. Hello, Sharon. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Sharon Hammond, Please. this is your life. It's not. It's not actually. This is your life, Sharon. But um, thanks. <laughs> I'm, thanks. Looking, I'm looking for the red book. <laughs> Sharon runs one of the many farms in the Ithon Valley, rearing sheep, cows, and a lot of chickens. So, our farm is called Upper Dolsluinia. Dolsluinia. Very good, Paul. It's simple for me. Slanvair, Puch, Wingish, Go Gerich, Windrobo, Slantisilio, Go Go Go. Simples, yeah? Simples. Very impressed. You farmed here for generations? I wasn't actually born on a farm or brought up on a farm, so. No, I can tell. You're far too sophisticated. I mean, look at it. I mean, there's. <laughs> muck I... everywhere. <laughs> Speaking of muck, Sharon's got a lovely pile of chicken poo ready to be inspected. Yeah, so here's our pile of poo. Yeah, <laughs> let's get upwind of it, shall we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is some of the litter that came out. Some yeah. of it's already been spread, uh -huh. um, but this, this is not that old. It hasn't been there that long, so let me just show you the consistency of it. it smells a bit cheesy. <laughs> Bob Mortimer would eat that, you know. Would he? Yeah. <laughs> My problem with it is that there's so much of it. If it gets into a river system and, and is causing the problems that phosphates do, it promotes algal growth, and, and that is not good for anyone or anything. What if there's a torrential downpour overnight? Does it not then start to run off into the ditches and into the stream? And... Right, so the whole point of it is, is because, because it's so solid, and you know, you've, you've demonstrated mm. that with the chunk that you had, that it doesn't wash away that easily. Also, we're not allowed to place these heaps anywhere near to watercourses. Sharon's fields border the Ithon, and so the careful spreading of the chicken muck is crucial. So, what we've got here is what's known as a buffer strip. Yeah. So if you stand about there and look back up, yep. I th and you can look in that direction as well, I think you can start to pick out a sort of a line. Yeah, I can see a very well-defined line. Actually. Yeah, OK. So anything that we apply to the ground is not allowed to be less than three metres from the river. See, that seems quite close to me. Sharon, I mean, who decides that? Well, that, that was, that, that's a Welsh Government directive. You can see all the stones, but there is a level of sediment. To me, the, the riverbed looks dead, you know. Sharon is clearly trying to reduce the farm's impact on the river, but her job is made tougher by the relentless demand for cheap food here in the UK. This is where we grow our chickens. In there, in that? In, yeah, in well, that, yeah. Maybe. Sharon grows her chickens for Avara, a heavyweight of the food industry that processes over two million chickens a week. Who are, who's this? <laughs> Timely arrival, who's this? That's chickens coming in. Oh, right, oh, OK. And what size are they? They're, They're day old. Us. Are they really? And yeah. where do you get them from? From Avara. And what do you feed them on? So, the, the feed programme is actually uh, worked out for us by Avara, who we grow for. Right. So, and they supply us with the feed. You and don't know what that is. I, I, 
I do. I know nothing technically about what's in right. that mix. Right. Okay. Okay. How many birds do you have here at any one time? Um, Forty thousand birds in each house, maximum. And how many houses have you got? Three. Right. Three. So you have 120,000 at any given time. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean over a year then? We would have about seven crops a year. Right. So yeah. that's nearly a million. That's a lot of litter, essence, poo, shite, mm -hmm. fragrance. Call it what you will. What can be done about that? Because it is causing problems in the river, isn't it? Yes. So. Although in this area there might be an excess of nutrients because of all the um, livestock in the area, in other areas of the country that's not the case. Could that um, litter and farmyard manure be transported across the country to where it's needed, to where mm -hmm. they're buying chemical fertilisers? Unless you're going to have that sort of system, it, it has to concentrate in, in, a, in an area because that makes the environmental impact of hauling things around less. Agricultural pollution has definitely had a part to play in the decline of our rivers. The millions of chickens that uh, are in and around the Wye Valley you know, are bound to have an effect on the environment, obviously. However, when you meet somebody who's engaged in the shower and you realise that the individuals involved are doing their level best to try and come up with solutions. The drive for cheap food is a real issue for our rivers. Adding to the pollution problems caused by water companies, industry and us. One of the organisations that monitors the health of our rivers when it comes to pollution is the Environment Agency. I've come to the Stroud Valley to meet up with one of their regional teams. Ah, yeah, that looks like them. Environment agency, busy people, mucking about in the river. Excellent. Created in 1996, the Environment Agency is there to enforce regulations, inspect pollution events and prosecute rule breakers across England. Today, the team are monitoring a stretch of the River Froome, which has suffered from agricultural and sewage pollution. I'm coming in. Are you going to give me a hand, kick something? Uh, I don't know, I might hinder you. <laughs> Looking at what's crawling around a riverbed is a great indicator of the health of a watercourse. Did you want to have a, have a go at I mean, in and then we'll get into the vegetation as well and have a sweep there? I'll have a go. Is it going to, what's it going to do for my image? <laughs> like that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, really, yeah. Get give it some. Toe, yeah. Toes in, make sure the sediment's getting lifted up. Ucha. There's a sort of morass of little tiny things yeah. all wriggling around. Is that a mayfly? Oh yeah, no, that, yeah, mayfly. Yeah, that's yeah. probably come out of the silt. Yeah. The silt just here. I mean, I, I actually get really moved by the plight of our rivers. And you must feel the same. Like, yeah, exactly. I think you know, most of us at work here do. It's mm. yeah, they're absolutely fascinating, and you know the range of life that, yeah. that's in them, and and how how fundamental it is the the whole food chain, the, yeah, the knock on. You know, yeah, I, you this... know, they're not very sort of cuddly waddly, are they? Like yeah. you know, mammals yeah. and birds, but. Without this, you know, the yeah. base layer, yeah. there wouldn't be any yeah. of them, so, yeah. yeah. Whilst the people on the ground are clearly passionate, in recent years the agency has taken a beating. We've seen a scaling back of their operation, a lack of ambition, and simply a lack of staff or budget to deal with the growing problems of pollution of our rivers. They're not going out and really investigating what is actually happening on the ground. The agency says it's under financial pressure. It claims budget cuts mean it's losing staff and expertise. The Environment Agency has confirmed that it's cutting one and a half thousand jobs. We have this dual problem of the agency not being funded, not having the staff, but also a lack of political will to actually enforce the regulations as they stand. Ultimately, the government decides how much money it wants to put into funding these kinds of enforcement activities. Nick Green is in charge of the area incident team. So, Nick, I was really nice to your team because they're nice people. And you're the boss, so I can be a little bit harsher with you. The Environment Agency is coming for a lot of criticism in the last few years. Do you think you are a viable organisation still? Are you fighting the good fight as much as you'd like to? 
Uh, we could always do with more resource. Uh, I think in terms of what we're doing with the resource that we've got, uh, it's fantastic. You've seen the, you've seen the people doing the, the work today. The guys that we met earlier are fantastic. Yeah. As individuals, they're great, but they're part of uh, an organisation. You know, where do you feel you can do better at the EEA? Working for the Environment Agency, we don't just do things in isolation because Yes, we have seen a huge reduction in terms of the money that we're given from um, Treasury. You know, there's always ways of trying to drive improvements even when you've got reduced amount of money available. But obviously, we, if we had more resource, we would be able to put eyes on the ground a lot more. We'd be able to do a bit more with regard to what, uh, what we achieve in terms of the environment. Whilst the agency's environmental protection budget is still below what it received in 2010, in 2022, the government granted them 142 million for this work, an increase from 2021. But some experts believe our rivers are getting worse and they may need more protection than ever before. My journey has brought me to Devon, famed for custard, cream teas, and the mighty River Tamar. Much like the Wye, this is a river that's facing its fair share of problems from agriculture as well as sewage pollution. But there are a couple of fellas who think they have a solution to the issues affecting our rivers. And it might not be one you'd expect. Nice to meet you, how you doing? Derek, Tay, nice to meet you. Ex-intensive farmer Derek and ecologist Tay are part of a growing rewilding movement. Basically, we have a few animals that are still domestic animals. We have some highland cattle here. There are a few unusual ones like water buffalo. And we have wild beavers living on our farm. Right. Here's our chariot. On a hot day, I'm jealous of the shorts. Although I'm not quite sure I've got the legs to pull them off. Please you. So get, get the back. Yeah, in the boot. Get yeah. the boots. Um, Where I belong. And it. Rewilding divides opinion. The idea is that giving land back over to nature can restore degraded landscapes and habitats, including our waterways. But many believe that land is needed for rearing livestock and growing crops to meet our food needs. Despite the controversy, Derek and Tay are committed to the cause. That was a fairly dramatic drive through a bit of a safari. the savannah. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? Are you playing God? Yeah, we're playing God. I mean, right. the animals here are all here to perform a function. So the digging we see in front of us is wild boar in here somewhere. Right. Um, the buffalo are in here to create big wallows that are full of insects like dragonflies and beetles. Um, the cattle are here to graze in a random way and as are the ponies. So the whole idea is we are creating a landscape using these animals that is fit to offer living space to a whole range of wild creatures. That's what we're doing. We're playing God. You are, yeah. <laughs> But at the pinnacle of what you're doing, I think, is the beaver. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah, I've been involved okay, with, yep. with the reintroduction of the beaver for about a quarter of a century. They're quite controversial, aren't they? The reintroduction has got its detractors as well as its proponents like you. They're not controversial with anybody that thinks. <laughs> it is the genesis of life. Next to humans, elephants, beavers are the third most impactful species on the planet. They're not on human level. I've never seen one <laughs> pilot Concord, but yeah. uh, they are builders and that, so they change the environment in a way not many other species do. It's right. the great water gardener that makes living space for all other life. Bear in mind they're very, very friendly, but bouncy. <laughs> Now, if you haven't quite guessed it already, Derek is bonkers about beavers. And loose in this 20-acre plot, there's a colony of his little furry friends. Quite magical in here, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. Here's a patch here where the bark's been removed. You see all those slots? Yeah. That's the tooth marks coming through. So, is this a beaver's playground? Yeah. There's a nice example of a handiwork down there yeah. on the floor. 
That's like, it's like, it's like a dumbbell, isn't it? Yeah, go on. Oh, that's enough. There you go. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Don't want to strain yourself no. too much. Beavers have been keeping waterways healthy across the globe for millennia. They were once native to Britain, but became extinct in the 16th century. But now they are back in Devon. So this is a beaver dam here. So what? It's, it's, <laughs> what? I would never have that down as a beaver dam in a million years. <laughs> yeah, no. the, that's what they naturally look like. The beavers move a lot of plants and, and roots and they vegetate over and they're completely green in the light. So the structure you normally associate with them is people standing next to something that's really dramatic, stark. Maybe it's just been newly built. But all those dams, in the end, when they're not new anymore, and when the mud takes and the plant roots take, they all look like this. The dams are catching 80% of the silts that are coming off the land. If you're trapping the nitrates and the phosphates, all that silt will be going into the streams, the rivers, yeah. down into the sea, polluting the estuaries. So the beavers are providing natural filter systems. Did you assess the quality of the water before reintroducing the beavers? Because surely they need fairly pristine conditions to thrive and survive, or are they very hardy? Beavers, beavers are fine with whatever water. Right. Um, certainly when they build their dams, um, they actually catch a lot of those pollutants. It kind right. of acts like a filter system. Great, so beavers won, everyone else nil so far, <laughs> yeah? Pretty much. <laughs> You're biased, you two. Come on. Uh, maybe, maybe a little maybe, bit, a little bit, maybe, yeah. Now, I didn't come all this way just to see some nibbled logs and muddy dams. I'm here to see a beaver. And as dusk sets in, I've been promised they'll come out and play. At least, that's the idea. In, in that... Well, that, that's one lodge there in yeah. the middle, and that's a great big pile of sticks and uh -huh. aquatic plants and everything else, which is built into a huge stick nest. And where's the other one, Tay, then? Uh, oh. It's just on the right. You can just about make out the top of a pile of big sticks with some purple loose strife coming yeah. out the top. Is there any way we can lure them out? I could sing, perhaps? I really wouldn't do that, I don't do know that, that it actually. would be no, I don't think that's you be singing that would really bring them in. Turns out beavers are a bit shy. Orders are to keep quiet and wait. A bit like fishing, really. Luckily, I've got some stellar small talk up my sleeve. I mean, they could be... Could be a nickname for a football team, couldn't it? Come on, you beavers. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it could, yeah. I bet it's a Canadian ice hockey team anyway, beavers. Probably is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, they showed up at the end. They popped up, they beavered around. You've got 15 seconds to sum up why we need more beavers. They produce life in great profusion. We can't sort this problem out. They can help us solve it. So you two, you're just beaver obsessed. <laughs> Even for an old cynic like me, 
The sight of a beaver swimming about is pretty special. But you need more than a few of them to solve our river problems. And at the moment, that doesn't look like happening anytime soon. It's time to head east to the chalk hills of southern England. This unique landscape has given rise to some of my favourite stretches of river, the chalk streams. There are just over 200 in the world and Hampshire is home to many. One of the finest examples is the River Test. The first time I saw the test, I was just struck by how spectacular it was the clarity of the water and it was just amazing to me from an artistic point of view because of all the different layers that you could see. You could see the reflections in the water, you could see everything underneath the water and the riverbed as well as everything around it. And I just immediately knew what I was going to paint and I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture the multi-leveled nature of it. Rivers have this kind of magical nature and all the life that it is a home for, I think is just a massive source of inspiration and beauty for a lot of artists. My guide to the test is Simon Cooper, a chalk stream expert who takes care of stretches of the river. Quintessential chalk stream. Yeah, let's get in it. Yeah. A lot of wild fish here, so. It does, honestly, this is yeah. a tremendous stretch. Chalk streams are different to most rivers. So most rivers, the rain falls, comes down from the hills, and within a few hours or a few days, the water's all in the sea. Hmm. But with a chalk stream, the water we're standing in now actually fell as rain six months ago, 12 months ago. Right. And so this fell on the chalk downs the chalk sort of absorbs it like a giant... Big, big sponge. Giant exactly. sponge. Like a yeah. giant sponge. <laughs> it's called an aquifer, isn't it? Yes. And it's a s sort of subterranean reservoir that, that feeds these rivers. Exactly, and it, yeah. and it sort of... And then it seeps out in sort of gazillions of tiny little springs yeah. that then aggregate yeah. to create yeah. these chalk streams. And so the thing about them is that they're always clear and they're always 10 degrees C. I mean, the, the water looks crystal clear, but the problem is there are huge numbers of pollutants in right. this water. And if I can show you, we've got a weed down here called blanket weed. So you it, normally you would, you know, weed is uh, an indication of a healthy river, isn't it? Exactly, and, and, and the king of weeds. <laughs> I know what it is, it's King Ranunculus. <laughs> exactly, and Ranunculus, relies on sunlight but unfortunately because of phosphates that um, come out of agriculture yeah. and mm. out of sewage mm. it promotes blanket weed and if mm. we put it up it's this sort of long filamentous uh, weed. Right weed. yeah you can, I can see why it might choke you know the, the bed and... And it does what it says on the label it's yeah. blanket. It's it blanket. Blanket, blanket and so what it does is... It, it really is blanket <laughs> weed isn't it? <laughs> But the problem is if you get too much, mm -hmm. it cuts off the sunlight and the ranunculus dies. <laughs> get out of it. <laughs> There's another a real problem for the chalk streams though, isn't there? Which is the uh, abstraction, the removal of drinking water from the aquifer. I take it to the water companies, or the water company. Mm -hmm. uh, water companies, <laughs> well, I mean, yes, we're, sort of 10, 15 miles down from the source of the River Test. Yeah. And if we went up to the headwaters of the River Test, we'd actually find they're drying up. Chalk streams across the south are suffering the same fate as the Test, as abstraction by water companies and climate change put pressure on the aquifers. The Blackbourne is a chalk stream that rises south of Bury St Edmunds. In places, it's all but dried up causing fish, invertebrates and plants to die. 
a chalk stream in trouble. Hardly any water, and beneath the surface, hardly any life. The difficulty is, since the last drought in 1976, mm. the water demand mm. has increased. Wow. So in 1976, you probably had a bath once a week. <laughs> you probably, <laughs> but now you probably have a shower every day and yeah. you're not alone in that. Most mm. people are like mm. that. So the average consumption per person has mm. gone up to 150 litres a day. So and the population has increased immensely as well. Yes. Mm. And we haven't built a single mm. new reservoir since 1989. And so where do you take the water from? Mm. You suck it from the aquifers. Yeah. And if you're taking it from the aquifers, it's mm. not going into mm. the rivers and the rivers at the headwater are literally dying. We point the finger, don't we, at people around the world who are damaging their mm -hmm. ecosystems. And here we are with this extraordinary landscape, and we're not treating it very well, are we, Simon? Off what the water regulator for England and Wales said, Ofwat is working with other regulators to develop a programme of new water resource infrastructure projects, including water transfers and new reservoirs. These projects will help to address the country's long-term needs alongside action to increase water efficiency and further reduce leaks. There are currently 18 projects going through the gated process of development. Now, rivers may well be the lifeblood of Britain, but as an island, we have another pretty big expanse of water to look after, the sea. This is Whitstable on the Kent coast, a busy fishing port and also a popular bolt hole for Londoners. Aren't beach shots brilliant? They're fantastic, aren't they? These ones cost about 10 million. Brilliant! Whitstable thrives on tourism, and at the very heart of the town is its famous oyster industry. Our thoughts turn to that delicious, silent hanger-on, the oyster, of which the world's best is the Whitstable native. Here they're sampling them before bringing them ashore. A job that lots of people would pay to have. To this day, Whitstable's seafood heritage is still an integral part of the town. And one of the many locals plying the trade is Graham West. You run West Wilkes, is yes. that right? West, West Wilkes. And you've run it for 4,000 years. Well, we run it for lots and lots of generations. Uh, in the past, my family have caught oysters yeah. and processed them. Oh, yeah. um, it goes back to long before Queen Victoria's times. In those days, they only used to fish for the Whitsman native oysters. Are they farmed, those oysters, or no, are they just, they just grow they're wild. wild, natural yeah, oysters? Yeah, they're wild. So that's a precious, precious resource stuff. that you have to manage yes. carefully, I would. We can only collect them when there's an hour in a month, you can only eat them when there's an hour in a month. Right. So once you go to the 1st of May, yeah. no more oysters. Right. That is the end of it. A major problem we have are selling anything that comes from Whitstable. And why is that? Because of the pollution. Unfortunately, the public have got the idea that anything that comes out of our seas are polluted right. and cannot be touched. Right. It is the stomach-churning sight we have seen far too many times this summer, raw sewage being pumped directly into the sea. Over the last 24 hours, one company, Southern Water, has discharged untreated sewage into almost 30 bathing sites. Southern Water has been fined for dumping billions of litres of raw sewage into the sea. A judge at Canterbury Crown Court said the offences were committed deliberately. These discharges come through the combined sewer overflow network, where water companies are given a permit to release a mix of rainwater and untreated wastewater during times of stress. But on the south coast, southern water has been found to be in breach of that permit, releasing untreated sewage into the very seawater used to grow and store oysters in Whitstable.
And um, these are my purification tanks. Right. These are the world famous Whitstall native oyster. Right. They go back 2,000 years where you found them, you found the Romans. Right. People do not want them because they associate Whitstall with Whitstall water, with Whitstall pollution. I'm buying Jersey oysters because I have got more of a guarantee that they're clean, yeah. okay, yeah. but it's cost me £20,000 extra year well, out of my pocket. Yeah, and it's tragic. You know, you're, you're a local Whitstall man, your family's been here for generations, and it's thrived on this very thing, and here you are having to go elsewhere. Well, every day I buy oysters, use Whitstable water. Yeah. I'm playing Russian roulette with people. I'm playing Russian roulette with my business because if I poison 20 people, yeah. the insurance ramifications on that yeah. are colossal. Crazy. It's, a, it's just crazy. I know I keep saying it, but it's, it's beyond belief what's going on. We've got to make a stand, but we've also got to make a stand and try our hardest to stay in business. If my grandfathers and great-grandfathers would have come back and they see what is going on now, I think they'd be mortified. In 2021, Southern Water were hit with a record-breaking £90 million fine for historic pollution incidents. But for Graham, discharges by Southern Water are still a problem. It got to the stage in March where I turned around and said, cannot deal with this anymore. I bought oysters, put them in my tanks. I've pumped water in, not been told that the water's polluted, get a message they dumped God knows what last night, and they've gone into a skip 7,000 oysters, 7,000 quid. You know, yeah. 7,000 pound in one week. And do you get, you know, recompensed for no, that? Are you sure no, for that? No, no. So no penny. compensation? Not a penny. They have been found guilty, they've been fined. 90 uh, million. 90 million? Yes. Yet they're not prepared to put their hand in their pocket for a... Not even a, we're sorry we've, we've released. Graham was very brave because he's highlighting a problem that might actually be his undoing. And for somebody like Graham to be able to stand up and sort of be counted and say, you know, look, this, this is where I come from. This is the stock. Of, of my family has done this for generations and I'm about to lose it all. If it carries on like this, there will be no oyster farming or oyster production in Whitstable in, in the very near future. Southern Water cover much of the south coast. In 2021, they reported discharging treated and untreated sewage for 145,654 hours and have a rock-bottom environmental performance rating of just one out of four stars. Like so many places I've seen around the country, the people of Whitstable have had enough and are fighting back. SOS Whitstable are a protest group that was set up by local swimmers in the wake of Southern Water's £90 million pound fine. We're all here today to tell Southern Water to clean up their act. We will not put up with them putting sewage in the sea like this forever. So here we are. This is the offending Welcome. pipe. There's actually two. Ah. So this is called Tankerton Circus and it's a combined <laughs> sewer overflow. Sally Burt Jones is the co-founder of SOS Whitstable. I mean, it doesn't even get to the end of the beach. I know we're at low tide, but there's no shame here, is there? No, we are literally stood on the beach for yeah. yeah. So we're able to see them now at low tide. However, at high tide, you wouldn't even know that they were here. Right. So in the so summer, when there are people swimming in the sea and lots of tourists around, obviously there's no understanding of what's happening under the water. So these pipes will be releasing essentially raw sewage I am looking right down your ship pipe, Southern Water, and it's <laughs> deeply unpleasant. So what are you at SOS actually doing about this, Sal? Have you made progress? We've been kicking up a huge fuss in every single way that we can. 
On a local level, we've definitely brought a huge amount of the community together to help us to try and fight this and raise awareness of what's happening. We've managed to get Southern Water to close one of these pipes just a little bit down the beach. On the government level and on a national level, uh, we're working really hard. I would love to tell you that we've made a lot of progress in 12 months since we started. However, that would not be true. Right. What I think we have done is managed to keep the conversation going. SOS Whitstable on their own are not going to succeed on the national stage, but they're part of a jigsaw of, of dedicated groups and people that I'm, I'm starting to think will actually do something serious about the state of our rivers and, and our seas and, and the pollution that we're all having to deal with. It's a crime, we all know it, and people are, are starting to stand up against it. And SOS Whitstable are in the vanguard. So hats off to them. When asked about the issues in Whitstable, Southern Water said, in the Whitstable area, we're investing 20 million pounds to improve treatment works, including closing one of the storm overflows. The UK's combined sewer network captures surface water during wet weather to prevent flooding of homes, schools and hospitals. We have heard our customers and are taking action. We are already piloting sustainable urban drainage to demonstrate how surface water can be separated at source to reduce storm overflows. In addition to investments that are already underway, we have submitted a programme to make further improvements as part of a £2 billion investment focusing on beaches, rivers, shellfish waters and other environmentally sensitive areas. To finish my journey, I've come home to London a city dear to my heart with a world-famous river, the historic Thames. Humans come and humans go, but I pay no mind to the passage of time as my watery form ebbs and flows. This is an ancient journey with the Jurassic legacy. Oh, the many tales I could tell of the things I've seen, but my secrets are mine to keep embedded in the twists and the turns, the ripples and the surges, in the daily dance of the high and low tide. From an embryonic Cotswold trickle to the insistently glorious tug of the North Sea. Humans come and humans go, but I pay no mind to the passage of time. For many, I am a playground, a place to frolic, swim, paddle or fish. And for others, I am nothing but a liquid wasteland. Humans come and humans go, but I pay no mind to the passage of time as my watery form ebbs and flows. Old Father Thames has had a checkered past. In the 1950s, the river was so dirty it was declared biologically dead. Decades of improvements brought it back to life, and salmon even returned at one point in the 80s. But today, it's suffering once more, as a rising population puts an immense strain on the old Victorian sewage system. This pressure is often relieved by releasing untreated wastewater into the river through the combined sewer overflow network. The company in charge of most of London's sewage is Thames Water. In 2022, they posted an operating profit of almost £430 million and paid their chief exec a handsome 1.3. In the same year, one of their treatment works released over 900 million litres of stormwater and sewage into the Thames in a single day. That's nearly 400 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Finally, there is now a ray of hope for this legendary river. Hello, nice helmet. Hello, <laughs> uh, Paul. Uh, don't feed me. 
<laughs> Welcome to Tideway. <laughs> Thanks very much. Darren is project manager of the Tideway, a major infrastructure development for the Thames, which will help free the river of dirty discharges. This is my world, this is my domain, this is where I live. Once completed, this £4.4 billion mega project will be operated by Thames Water. I've got to wear these, is that right? You do. At all times. Helmet on. God, what a look. This is not showbiz, is it? This is the world of corporate sewage or Guantanamo Bay. Where's my rider? Where's my agent? These are the old coal yeah. sheds. Yeah, of course. Cool yeah. Greenwich is one of 24 sites across the capital upgrading the Victorian system and building a new future for the Thames. Here we are. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, Greenwich's uh, Thames Water Pumping Station. Uh -huh. So Thames Water own this, this asset. It's a, it's a listed building, it's dealing, it's fully live, fully operational. The reason behind Tideway is just a, a, an old age problem that the river is just too dirty. It, the amount of sewerage, 40 million tonnes a year, um, being just directly pumped into the river was just not acceptable and we no. need to do something about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary project, but you can see evidence all around of the pressure that yeah. is on the river because there's new flat mm. developments there all, all around us, aren't there? Poke your head over the side there. OK. That's the one. So if you look down there now, you can see the live sewers, Paul, coming through. So there's three sewers coming into here from oh. all the parts of Greenwich and Lewisham. It's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. No, not at the moment. I bet, I bet on some... Oh, there we are. Excuse the smell, it wasn't me. Oh, Someone oh, just oh. flushed. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty grim, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so what you can see here, Paul, is uh, where the sewers come in um, from all over Greenwich on a day-to-day -day basis. They go right. through here, go into the public station, pumped off for treatment as, as normal. When the flows get too much, heavy rain, big storms, it backflows and all the way down to the river and into the river, which we don't want to see. No, That's we why we're here. So, yeah. so get on with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're building a CSO, confined sewer outflow. Um, that will intercept this overflow. Right. And then all of it will go out to Beckton for treatment. And then it'll be all treated into clean water of Beckton and, and pumped out to sea as, as clean water. Brilliant. Have you got something against Beckton or something? No, they no? just they just love treating dirty water. <laughs> So we're going to give it all to them. Hats off to them, mate. <laughs> we're going to give it all to them. They probably so, wouldn't want to do it in Chelsea, would they? Correct, yeah. yeah. So you carry your little rebreather with you. OK. Throw it over your shoulder. Will do. Do I need to do this up again? It's up to you. OK, I well, won't from there. And I'll take mine. Great. And let's go down the stairs and we'll have a little look at what we're building. This way? Yep, follow me. Having avoided it for so long, now is the time to head into the sewers below. Follow me. Right. In its current setup, about eight million tonnes of sewerage a year, just from this area, just from Greenwich, gets dumped directly into the river untreated. No. Yeah. So we're intercepting like 95 more percent of all of that. That that's going to get intercepted by our Tideway tunnel and out for treatment. Yeah. My Paul, we're now going to head down 57 metres to the bottom of the shaft. No, we're not. Let's go. All right. You take me to all the mon most wonderful places, don't you? How long does it take? A couple of minutes. OK. Descending 252 stairs, I'm heading into the bowels of the tideway. Down. It's incredible. It's like a sort of industrial Sistine Chapel, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Upside down chapel. Yeah. Very bond, you know, especially all those noises as we're coming down. Whoop, yeah. whoop. Yeah. Incredible. This hole of hope will intercept the excess rainwater and sewage that puts pressure on the existing system, diverting it along the 25 kilometer network of tunnels to be properly dealt with. 
I mean, it feels like we're slightly walking to our doom. Yeah, we're walking downhill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we are, Paul. Yeah. In the Greenwich Connection Tunnel. This is the finished product. This is yes. what Tideway is going to look like. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's impressively smooth. Yeah, yeah. Some of my old classroom work wasn't as good as this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. if we were down here, of course, when it's operational, we'd see a tidal wave of effluent. Yeah, you right. might need to bring a little boat with you, or maybe yeah. then waders are used. Yeah, 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 true. It's very impressive. It's very laudable. Extraordinary feat of construction. Yeah, fantastic. It's going to take a lot of pressure off the River Thames, and I assume that you've built in extra capacity, operational absolutely. capacity, to deal with, you know, the, the excess demands that are going to occur. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This, 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 this tunnel, all of Tideway network, has been designed for the population of London with 120-year design life. Right. So it, it should last, and it, it should do its capacity for the next 120 years at least. I expected to have to look in detail at sewage at some point. <laughs> I'm obviously more at home, you know, looking around the chalk streams and our beautiful rivers. But that's the story of our rivers. You know, they've been used as a dumping ground for waste, sewage. The river washes everything away. It washes your sins away. But unfortunately, sometimes your sins come back to bite you on the bum. Tideway is a huge step forward for the Thames, but according to Ofwat, there are no plans to build any other super sewers in England. We asked the government about their plans to clean the rivers, and they said, Our ambitious objective is to return at least three quarters of our waters to be close to their natural state. We have new legal targets to drive down pollution, are requiring water companies to deliver their largest ever infrastructure programme to reduce sewage spills, and our new initiatives will help farmers reduce nutrient pollution from agriculture. Protecting our precious water resources is key, and we will continue to work with regulators to hold polluters to account. visited all these wonderful river systems and every single one of them shows some sign of degradation or outright pollution. I've met so many dedicated and concerned individuals and small organisations and their passion is to make sure that our rivers run clean. They're fighting a good fight but they can't do it on their own. But I would like to see pure, clean rivers and a water supply for us as humans so that we can survive. Also, I don't want to say goodbye to this. Look at it. How beautiful is it? So, the buck stops with the government. It's very straightforward. Sort it out.